Welcome to Fundamentals for Startups presented by Commotion Labs. My name is Yuli Rivera, Commotion Labs Life Sciences Senior Manager. Fundamentals for Startups is our regular lecture series open to anyone interested in learning about entrepreneurship or building a startup. Each week, we feature experts from various fields who bring you insights and inspiration and give you the opportunity to ask questions. All sessions are recorded and archived on Commotion's website. If you've joined us before, you know that Commotion Labs is a multi-industry incubator program hosting early stage startups from both inside and outside the UW community. From critical infrastructure to learning, mentoring, and networking, Commotion Labs is committed to nurturing and enabling startup success. And we do this without taking equity or IP. We operate out of three locations on campus, each with its own industry focus. One in life sciences and another one in hardware and flu call, and a third focused on technology and startup hall. If you're a founder looking for somewhere to thrive, we'd love to talk to you. While we wait for everyone to join us, I'd like to make a few announcements. This quarter, we are highlighting some successful recent graduates of our Commotion Labs program. Next week, we'll be hearing from Brandon Doyle, co-founder and CEO of Violet, who will present Scaling a Hardware Startup with UW as a partner. For our full schedule and to register for future fundamentals uh, events, please visit the Commotion Labs section of our website and click on the Fundamentals for Startup link. Today, Dr. Ingrid Swanson Poltz is here to present the P PVP biologic story, what it takes to bring a molecule from concept to commercial use. Dr. Ingrid Swanson Poltz is Chief Technology Officer at MOPAC Biologics and a Translational Advisor at the Institute for Protein Design. She was Chief Scientific Officer of PVP, an IPD stand out company acquired by Takeda Pharmaceuticals in 2020 and served as the CEO for PV, PVP in its early years. Ingrid will take all questions in the YouTube chat. Feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. I will now turn over the event to over to Ingrid. Hi, thanks, Yuli. Um, so my talk, uh, which is called um, PVP Biologics, um, what it takes to bring molecule uh, from concept to commercial use, is uh, it, it's a bit optimistic because the molecule is not yet in commercial use. Uh, it is in currently in phase two clinical trials, um, but you know we hope someday that it will uh, exist uh, as a a drug that um, that will be available to people with celiac disease. Um, so I'm going to start by giving you a summary um, of the PVP biologic story, and then I'll um, I'll uh, break into uh, telling this more in a, in a story format than I than I normally tell. Um, so PVP Biologics is a startup from the UW uh, that's based on technology um, that we developed there called uh, that we call Kumamax, uh, which is an enzyme. Uh, and that's been developed as an oral therapeutic for celiac disease. And we founded this company based on this technology in 2012, uh, licensed the technology from the UW in 2016, and spun out. In, um, in late 2016, we entered into a $35 million partnership with a drug company called Takeda Pharmaceuticals, which funded the work to uh, advance this molecule through phase one clinical trials. And then in late February 2020, uh, the company was acquired by Takeda. And this is an, a rendered image of the, um, of the Kumumax molecule. So just a little background on myself. Uh, I'm from a, a, a suburb of Minneapolis in Minnesota. Um, and when I was growing up, I was really interested in the concept of engineering uh, life. I loved uh, studying how uh, molecules fit together uh, like Legos to put uh, to bring together a functioning cell uh, or functioning molecular machines. I always thought that was fascinating. Um, so I studied biology in college and then did a stint at the Jackson Labs in Bar Harbor, Maine, uh, before I came to the UW as a, a graduate student in the Department of Microbiology. Um, and I'm going to start with my story there uh, while I was a graduate student in uh, microbiology. 
Um, so this story really has its beginning on uh, the 2nd of May in 2007. And just to give you an idea of how long ago that really was, um, George W. Bush was still president. Tony Blair was the prime minister. Uh, the song Girlfriend by Avril Lavigne was the number one song in the U.S. In Seattle, uh, LCD sound system played at the show box. Uh, there was a, a major weather event uh, in Texas. And Nature happened to run a blurb uh, from George Church about an undergraduate student competition called iGEM, which stands for the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition that I read. Um, and I thought it was fascinating. So this was about how to use synthetic biology uh, to design um, and build new biological systems. And undergraduates did this over the course of the summer and then traveled to MIT in the fall uh, and present their work and compete against other undergraduate teams from all over the world um, for, for the grand prize. Uh, and an example of a, of a project cited in this blurb was uh, an iGEM team from UT Austin had engineered E. coli, uh, which is a standard lab bacteria, to see light, to detect and respond to light. And I thought, and at the bottom right of this slide is, um, is a photograph that was shined onto a lawn of bacteria that then produced a pigment to recapitulate what it was they had seen. Um, I thought this was fascinating and the um, synthetic biology applications seemed endless. So I wanted to get involved um, to, to exercise this engineering interest that I had in the UW iGEM team. But as it turns out, we didn't have a team. So in 2007, I traveled to iGEM uh, in the fall, really just to learn about what it was about. Uh, and I was really impressed with the uh, different teams and different projects. So with help from the um, other departments in and my department, microbiology, in 2008, we founded the UW team. Um, so those of you who are students at the UW might recognize, um, I, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but on the upper right picture, the tallest individual there is um, Jeff Navala, who is now, now an assistant professor in computer science at the UW. He was an undergraduate in our first um, uh, iGEM team at the UW. And he actually was working with a lab on campus called the Baker Lab, um, who specialized in protein structure prediction and protein design. And they got involved in the iGEM team in 2009 and 2010. Uh, so in 2010, we built antibiotics for the 21st century. That was our project. Um, I and my, myself and another graduate student, Justin Siegel in the Baker Lab were the advisors for the team. Um, and we used the, the Baker Lab resources uh, for protein design to, um, to work on a lot of these projects. In 2011, we had students who had friends with celiac disease, and so they wanted to use their summer project to build a therapeutic for the disease. Um, so that was the, the question that we started this project with. Can we build a molecule that has the potential to treat celiac disease? And I just wanted to highlight three of the undergraduates who did a lot of this work in building this prototype, which became the, the Kumamax prototype. Um, so just to take a step back now, I need to tell you a little bit about celiac disease. Um, there are about 2.4 million people in the U.S. that are thought to have this disease. And the disease is really characterized by an inappropriate immune response to dietary gluten, which is a protein found in any food containing wheat, rye, or barley. And in most uh, normal healthy people, gluten just passes through and doesn't cause a problem. Uh, the incompletely digested gluten, because gluten is a very difficult protein to digest. But in most people, this doesn't cause a problem. People with celiac disease mount an inflammatory immune response to these incompletely digested uh, gluten fragments. Um, the only treatment available is a, is a, a very strict gluten-free diet, which is difficult because um, gluten contamination is very, very common, and only a small amount of gluten can trigger the disease uh, in, a, in a lot of these patients. So um, we, didn't we didn't come up with the idea of oral enzyme therapy for treating the, the disease, um, but this is an idea that had been in the field for a long time. Uh, the problem is that naturally occurring enzymes are not very good at um, breaking down gluten in the stomach. 
because the stomach is a really harsh environment. Um, so what we wanted was an enzyme, uh, which is a protein that um, catalyzes uh, a chemical reaction. We wanted an enzyme that could break down gluten in the stomach uh, that would work rapidly and um, that could destroy all of the immunogenic parts of gluten and be specific for gluten. Uh, and in addition to that, it should be easy and cheap to manufacture because your, uh, the bar for safety is very high given that you can treat this disease with a gluten-free diet. So uh, this actually presented a great opportunity for protein design because instead of trying to find a naturally occurring enzyme that had all of these characteristics, we could instart, instead start with an enzyme that had some of these characteristics, uh, namely the ability to work in the human stomach and then engineer in the characteristics that were lacking. Uh, and that is exactly what we did. So when the students developed this prototype, Cumax molecule, um, we started using a computer game-like interface uh, to the Rosetta molecular modeling suite called Foldit. Uh, and the students made um, mutations uh, on the computer, theoretical mutations in and around the, um, the sort of business end of this enzyme called the active sites. Um, and then we tested around 100 or so of their favorite designs. Uh, and then those that had uh, showed promise, we then combined the mutations into an iterative round of design build test, uh, which eventually led to a molecule that did actually have uh, some activity against immunogenic fractions of gluten. So we took this work um, to the competition in 2011. And the UW team actually won that competition uh, that year. There were over 165 teams participating, and we were the first US team ever to win the grand prize, which was very exciting. Um, so after that, we came home, uh, did a couple more experiments, published a paper uh, on the, the prototype, and the students went off to graduate school. Now we were left with the question, okay, so we have this prototype technology, it seems to do something cool, but can it be commercially viable? Um, and that, uh, that is a big, uh, a, a big leap from just having a prototype that has an indication that it could do something to, um, is this ready to take out of the UW? Um, and a lot of these undergraduate student projects, for example, our earlier engine projects, they once once the um, once the competition is over, they they just kind of languish on the shelf and and are forgotten about. So to prevent that from happening with this technology, uh, I became a postdoc in David Baker's lab. I graduated from graduate school, and um, decided to pursue this to see if in fact we can turn this into a commercially viable project. Uh, at at that time, I founded uh, PVP Biologics. Um, it was originally called Proteus Biologics, um, founded with uh, myself, uh, Justin Siegel, who is the other iGEM advisor uh, involved in this project, as I mentioned, and uh, David Baker. Um, we were very involved with the UW throughout this entire uh, early, early uh, phase of our company. Um, we did found the company in 2012, but we didn't spin out until 2016. And during those years, we got a lot of support from the UW, including uh, a CFP, a Commercialization Fellowship Postdoc, that paid my salary in those, um, in those earlier years, uh, as well as uh, a, a CGF award, which is Commercialization Gap Funding, that I used to hire a research assistant, uh, Clancy Wolf, who is, is shown in a picture here. And that was really critical to moving this, um, to moving this company because while, while I um, was busy doing a lot of the things that, that one needs to do in an early company, Clancy could be uh, um, pursuing the technology in the lab. So we were able to to really move forward on sort of both fronts, the, the business end and the scientific end, because we had um, you know, strong help in, in both sections. During this time, so we had filed a patent on that initial technology um, before we'd even presented at iGEM. We filed a second patent that covered more of, uh, of a breadth of molecules that could um, potentially act the same way as the prototype. And we worked to, to um, we engineered that molecule from that starting point. Uh, we worked on improving its, um, its uh, activity, um, its speed, its specificity, and its manufacturability. 
Um, during this time, we also negotiated an exclusive license with UW, and this was really expensive because, uh, particularly on a, on a postdoc salary, because we used a, a law firm that didn't defer the costs, and, um, and we wanted to do it right from the start, so we went to a law firm to help us do this. Um, and we, we ended up paying those costs out of pocket, uh, but turns out that, that there are law firms that will, will um, defer cost until you get funded as a company, uh, which is something that we found out later. So I'm putting it out there for, for anyone who's starting a company. Um, so during this time, we improved the enzyme. Uh, we ended up doing some uh, some proof of concept work in the lab, showing that the enzyme can break down gluten in beer. So here we have Chain Breaker White IPA, which is a wheat beer, uh, trying to get the highest amount of uh, gluten in beer uh, to, to demonstrate its activity. And we also went to Dix, uh, which is a, a Seattle. Uh, institution for burgers, uh, bought a hamburger and vanilla shake, blended it all, tested the enzyme, uh, found that it was driving the level of uh, gluten in these uh, foodstuffs below the level that that um, is required to call your food gluten free. So we were really excited about this, uh, about these studies. Um, at this point, I, I went on as faculty at the IPD as a translational investigator, which is a position, I'm sorry, the IPD is the Institute for Protein Design. Uh, and it's at an institute at the University of Washington um, that uh, houses all kinds of protein design projects uh, in which David Baker is the director. So I took a position as a translational investigator at the Institute for Protein Design, which is a PI, a principal investigator. Um, so I had my own lab and, and could write my own grants, um, but I was unable to take graduate students because the point of this role is that you're going to spin out within a, a, a you know, short period of time. Uh, you'll spin out with a company. Um, that's why it's called a, a translational investigator position. Uh, we filed the third patent. We applied for some SBIR, STTR grants. Uh, you know, more non-dilutive funding is, is always good, uh, but we were unsuccessful. Um, we had, uh, we did end up getting a, a, a grant from the Life Science Discovery Fund, which unfortunately no longer exists in the state of Washington, um, for $500,000, which allowed us to, uh, to, um, to do some manufacturing work and some key in vivo experiments uh, for this uh, for this product. During this time, we talked to lots of people at Commotion and the Institute for Translational Health Sciences. There are tons of great great um, resources there. Um, we had a great um, a patent attorney at Commotion. Um, we had a great technology manager. We got an entrepreneur in residence who gave us a lot of business advice. Um, we had a, a, a commercialization fellow, um, which we were able to use his time through the Washington Research Foundation. Uh, he did a lot of work for us developing a business case. Um, we participated in the Washington Innovation Network, uh, the WIND program through Life Science Washington, which is also another great resource. Uh, developed a, through, through all these resources, we developed a network of consultants that had industry experience, particularly clinical, um, animal toxicology studies, and manufacturing. Uh, it additionally presented the work every chance I got, including at celiac uh, conferences, so that I got to know um, the other people who were involved in the field. It turns out celiac is a fairly small field. Uh, this, this was very valuable because as, as our name got out there and we started talking to venture capital, um, they, you know, they would call up the celiac experts and say, hey, have you heard of this technology? Is it legit? And uh, given that we had presented, you know, they, they were aware of us. Unfortunately, we had to change our name because we um, we didn't pick a name that was unique enough. And even though we were uh, housed at the university with really no um, no assets whatsoever, we only had a thousand dollars in our bank account and an option um, to to negotiate a license. Um, we had to change our name because there's a Proteus Digital Health in California that sent a cease and desist letter to us. Um, so we changed our name to PVP, which uh, uh, stands for protein versus protein. And because we were developing an enzyme, which is a protein to attack an, a, a protein, which is gluten. Um, we tried to just make it as, as unique as we could so we wouldn't run into that problem again. 
Uh, so our last, our last in vivo um, proof of concept study was in rats, um, where we basically fed rats a meal containing gluten, uh, first gave them the enzyme, uh, a liquid enzyme, and then fed them a meal containing gluten. And then after 30 minutes, took all the material back up again and uh, quantified the amount of gluten present. Um, and so here you can see the black bar is without the enzyme. On the right are three different concentrations of our enzyme, um, which, in which we're degrading over 99% of the gluten. And this is compared to some naturally occurring enzymes that were in clinical trials for the treatment of celiac disease. Um, being naturally occurring, of course, uh, they, they, um, they had problems that, that we were able to surmount by um, rationally engineering our enzyme. Um, so at this point, we, it was about time to leave the UW. Uh, we happened to have, uh, we had this chance meeting with this incredible individual, uh, Tachi Yamada, who unfortunately passed away uh, a little over a year ago, but he was uh, really a force of nature in the, um, in the Seattle biotech scene and, and really globally. Um, through with him, so we met him. He was very interested in our company, having been, uh, it, have it, being that he was a gastroenterologist uh, and uh, also um, connected with a lot of drug companies who were doing gastroenterology. Um, through him, we were able to initiate some preliminary meetings with VCs. Um, at that point, our company was really just myself and Justin, who was the other um, iGEM advisor with whom I founded the company. We interviewed a lot of candidate CEOs, but we just didn't find the perfect fit. Uh, and, and we were unwilling to, um, to hand over the company uh, in, unless we, we really felt like it was the perfect fit. Um, we, we converted from a C LLC to a C Corp during this time, um, which it seems like a real trivial thing, but ended up having massive tax implications uh, later on down the line. Um, and we started our license negotiation with the UW. We switched our law firm to a firm that deferred cost uh, for early biotechs um, and we're, were able to negotiate a license, which was, um, it, in fact, we ended up racking up a lot of money in law firm costs. So this was really critical. Um, and we also, let's see, we initiated tech transfer to develop manufacturing for the enzyme. Turns out the ability to manufacture your product is a big deal. Uh, you can have, you can demonstrate something as, as a proof of concept in the lab, but if you can't make it at the scale you need to make it at, then you really just have an academic project and, and you'll never have a product. Um, the VC started to get serious in our talks, but our competitor, those naturally occurring enzymes, their clinical trial results uh, became public and they weren't that good. So VCs got spooked and stopped returning our calls. So we basically went overnight from having lots of interest to, to crickets. Uh, and, and But at that point, um, Tachi, we went to Tachi and said, you know, but this is a problem. We're not getting any more traction. And he basically said, we don't need VCs. Uh, let's switch our business. Let's switch our focus. Let's switch our business model. So we did that. Uh, but before I tell you about what we did, I just want to talk about, we developed a net present value document. And this is an exercise that's done by a lot of early companies um, in order to, in order to help them calculate what their value might be. And it's a large calculation. Um, we used a, a massive spreadsheet based on a lot of different factors, um, including patent life, uh, what would the market be, size of the market, potential market, different market factions, um, and when you might penetrate those factions, uh, cost of goods, your pricing, your dosage, the rate of diagnosis and how that's expected to change over time. Uh, what your competition is, uh, what you expect your marketing expenses to be, uh, assumptions about reimbursement, particularly important for drugs where, um, where you have a, a payer, uh, a, that's the insurance company, um, the cost of capital uh, that it would take to, to move the project forward, various adjustments for risk, because uh, only 6% of drugs that start off um, at, with an IND end up, uh, ever end up making it uh, commercially. 
year to year changes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we used all this information to calculate a valuation. And given the market size, the celiac was so massive and there was no competition out there, we, 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 we had this large valuation that basically the VCs laughed at us. Um, they were very glad that we had gone through this exercise and we knew what we were talking about, but they told us that evaluation is really dependent on how much money it's gonna to cost to get us from point A to point B. Point B being a value inflection point at which, um, at which the uh, company would be expected to be worth N dollars. Um, and the amount of return that the VC wanted to take combined with the, uh, with, uh, so that is used to then calculate a, a, a percentage of the initial amount that they would put in, how much they owned, and that what it, you know gives you a valuation. Um, so I'm not sorry that we went through this, uh, this exercise because it was very valuable to understand all of these things. Um, but using it to calculate a, a valuation was um, was not as effective as we were hoping. So in 2016, um, we switched from targeting to VCs to instead targeting a strategic partnership in which uh, we targeted drug companies, the idea being that they could fund the, the early clinical trials instead of having venture capital funded and then selling to a drug company. What if drug company funded this work from the start and then they had the option to purchase the company uh, at, a, at some predetermined price, which was a discount from what market price would be. Um, so we started talking seriously to, um, to drug companies about this possibility. We established a data room um, with about a dozen reports detailing uh, developments in lab data on uh, our molecule. Uh, Takeda Pharmaceuticals was the front runner uh, of these companies. In addition, we took on a team uh, in the spring. We finally uh, found through Tachi, uh, who had worked with these individuals in the past, a development team that was um, that had the characteristics that we were looking for. They would just come off um, a, another GI company uh, that went through early stage clinical trials uh, and was purchased by by a drug company. Um, so they had, they had just uh, basically gone through something similar that we were hoping to do. Um, our team all worked at risk because we had no funding. Um, remember that all of our funding up to this point was grant funding. Uh, which went to our project at the UW. Um, the, it, this individual, Adam Simpson, who later became our CEO, we took him on as a president as um, kind of an, ex an exploratory period to see um, if we liked working with each other. Turns out we did. Uh, he took over the negotiations at that point. Uh, we established a board of directors with Tanchi as our chairman, established a scientific advisory board. Um, we got a term sheet in June 2016 from Takeda um, and we had IP lawyers conduct a, a freedom to operate um, uh, uh, exercise, um, which basically looks at uh, what other comp competitors, uh, competing technology or patents might be uh, in your space uh, and just describing that kind of patent landscape. The UW doesn't do that, or at least they didn't do that when we were spinning out. I doubt they do that now. Um, so we had to go to a, a, another law firm who could establish that for us and, uh, and let these companies know um, that we had the freedom to operate. Uh, just a note on our team, um, we had it, our total was that we had 10 employees. Um, we were a pretty small company. Um, we had a, a, the team was really important. We had a venture capital, uh, when we were talking to venture capital, we had someone tell us that uh, good people can make a mediocre product succeed, but mediocre people can make even a good product fail, which is why they, they invested in teams. Uh, they really looked for teams that they thought could, um, could deliver. Uh, and we, and we really had, did have a great team. Um, so in 2016, we entered into this partnership deal with Takeda, uh, which was kind of a chicken and egg issue because we had to, um, we couldn't enter into the deal until we had the license because the Takeda wasn't going to give us money unless we had the license for the technology. But we couldn't, um, 
we couldn't get the license until we negotiated it with the UW. And at the point where a company has negotiated a license with the UW, you have to leave because um, at that point, um, you know, the, the UW, it's considered a conflict of interest for the UW to be housing a, a company that, um, that it, you know, is a, is a third party company. Um, but we couldn't leave until we had the money from Takeda. So we had to kind of do everything at once. So we executed the license in November 2016. And then less than a month later, we executed the agreement with Takeda um, to fund our work through phase one um, under the structure that I had previously mentioned. So at a predetermined price that would purchase PVP uh, if they if um, if they uh, approved of how the phase one project went. Um, and it was a, it, it's really a good deal for both parties involved because they get to fund what they consider a small amount of money uh, to spend for a, a seriously discounted against market price. And uh, we were able to, um, you know, kind of cut out the VC middleman. And, um, and uh, if they chose not to exercise the option to purchase, then we just got $35 million, the development funding to, um, to proceed with this project, after which it would return to being completely our project and we would still own the entire company. Uh, so the next question now was, okay, so we had a prototype and then we developed it into commercially viable molecule and got funding to, um, to, uh, to see whether it has real world value. So now can we demonstrate that real world value, which was safety and effectiveness in humans? And I put manufacturability because that was also very, very important and ended up taking about 80 to 90% of our time and effort was the ability to make this, this protein. Um, just doing a time check, uh, looks like I'm doing all right. Uh, so we, upon spin out, we actually had uh, uh, locations in both San Diego and Seattle. Uh, we started our lab at Comotion's Fluke Hall that uh, Yuli was uh, uh, just mentioning on January 1st in 2017. And this was a picture of our space in, in Fluke Hall. Uh, it was. It really was a great space. It had everything we needed. Um, we hired two more people in the lab, so we had four people in Seattle, including myself. Um, the corporate office was in San Diego, so that was where our team was located, um, and that's where our CEO was, our chief development officer, who was essentially our chief medical officer, VPs of manufacturing and program management. We had an office manager and a treasurer. Uh, that was really our core um, group of employees. Um, we, we were mostly a virtual company. So our lab, uh, we, did, um, we did support for manufacturing and for bioanalytical and analytical method development in our lab. Um, and most of our, uh, 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 all of our other work was performed um, virtually, essentially. We had an office space, but, um, but most of our work was done by means of consultants who were located all over the world. So we were able to get um, area expert consultants, some of which we worked with every day, um, but, but they basically existed as consultants for PVP. Uh, we communicated by teleconferencing before it was cool. So instead of Zoom, we used a, a different system called Life Size Cloud. Um, this was what our this was kind of our daily meeting life. We would have a, 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 a we would communicate um, remotely and uh, and and it worked fine. So you know you can have distributed. Uh, employees, uh, we would meet a, a couple of times a quarter or once a quarter, either in Seattle or San Diego, and that that seemed to be sufficient. So the work we did during this time, we opened two INDs, which stands for Investigational New Drug Applications with the FDA. Um, we scaled up production of Kuma 62, which was not an easy task, from lab scale, milligram scale, to the phase one scale, a kilogram, to preparing for phase two. So by that time, we were making this enzyme a kilogram scale. Um, so, you know, a, a million fold uh, difference in, uh, in, the, in the scale that we were producing this enzyme at. Uh, and we developed analytical methods uh, for each of these phases. Um, we, we also did our phase one clinical trials. Uh, so our phase one unit was in California. I developed bioanalytical methods, uh, safety and tolerability, 
um, establish that in our phase one study, as well as proof of mechanism. So if you remember, we did uh, in rats, we fed them a gluten-containing meal, and first the enzyme, then the gluten-containing meal, and then waited a little bit, and then sucked up the, the material and quantified gluten. We did the same thing in people. So this phase one experiment, we gave people the drug, uh, then had them eat a tasty meal containing gluten, uh, let them sit and digest for about half an hour, and then sucked everything out of the stomach through a tube that went through the nose and, um, and quantified the amount of gluten present. Uh, it's not a pretty study, um, but we had a lot of really passionate volunteers who had people with, um, with family members or friends who had celiac disease that wanted to participate in the trial. And, uh, and uh, we didn't actually have a problem recruiting. Um, at, during this time, we also did prep work for phase two. So that was part of our deal with Decada is that we would complete phase one and get them ready to, to hit the ground running for a phase two study, which was mostly manufacturer of the drug and uh, demonstrating more long-term uh, toxicity studies. Also, I should mention our phase one, this was done in healthy individuals, not celiac patients. Um, so so we, we quantified, measured the amount of gluten degradation in the human stomach in healthy individuals. We also per performed some additional market research because even though we had a partner set up to purchase us at the end of our phase one, in the event that they declined to exercise the option, which companies can do for any number of reasons, uh, including like just a change in strategic focus of the company, we, we wanted to be able to have a strong market case uh, in case we needed to shop this project around. Um, so I know I've thrown a lot of stuff at um, at you guys, but um, but everything did not go, you know, smoothly. We had a lot of hitches. Um, sometimes we would run into a problem that would seem difficult to surmount, um, and that required you know a lot of heads coming together and a lot of people doing different things. So in a startup company, uh, you. you you don't necessarily get siloed to, to doing a particular one particular job. We kind of all did a lot of different jobs and we all kind of had to um, come together to solve some of these pro problems. So we had manufacturing issues. We had issues with our methods. Of course, I can't, I don't know of any project that has ever not had budget issues. Um, and in fact, I think we skidded through uh, uh, that, uh, our, our huge chunk of, um, of funding uh, I think we basically right through the end, we we just barely made it, um, which I which I understand is fairly common. Uh, we had regulatory questions, um, we had personnel issues that needed to be dealt with, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And during one of the more difficult times, uh, our CEO Adam Simpson sent out this this graphic called the emotional journey of creating anything great. Um, which I'm sharing with you here, starting with you have the best idea ever. So that that's starting with kind of our Kumamax prototype and going into it, this will be fun. And then it's it's harder than you thought. And then you realize how much work this is. And then you can either, um, you might be able to bridge and go to, okay, but it still sucks. Uh, you want to try not to get stuck in the dark swamp of despair, um, which can happen. Um, but then it, it, all of this work and effort can lead to, uh, you know, when, if this drug ever, is ever commercially available, it will certainly be one of the things I am the most proud of. Um, so that's a nice segue to our phase one results. Uh, so after all of this work that we did in our in uh, at PVP, um, using this this method that I described of testing whether the enzyme is working in people. Um, these, are, these are the results. So what we're looking at, uh, this is the y-axis here is the amount of gluten. Um, and then the x-axis are different groups uh, that were tested on um, the gray bar and the blue bar, just two different measurement methods measuring different immunogenic fractions of gluten. And you can see that particularly on, on the right-hand side, I think it might be the most clear um, to see this, uh, uh, the placebo groups 
are much, much higher than those that um, have our drug, which we called Kuma 62 and was renamed by Takeda to TAC 62. Uh, so with TAC 62, we're seeing very, very low levels of gluten. Um, you'll have to note that the y-axis is in a log scale. Um, so we in fact saw that the enzyme is doing in, in uh, people um, exactly what it does in, uh, in our test tubes and in rats. Uh, this was the very first demonstration we had that that was a proof of concept that it's working since we did the rat study. So throughout PVP, all the work that we did, the manufacturing work, the toxicity work, regulatory work, all of that work was was based on the assumption that it would work in people. So getting this data was the first indication that we had something that is actually doing as expected in, in people, which is very exciting. Uh, remember that this isn't healthy volunteers. We're just looking at the amount of gluten degradation in, in, in the human stomach. So um, to kind of bring you now to where we were when we, when uh, on the day that, um, that PVP was acquired. Uh, now Donald Trump was president, Boris Johnson was the prime minister. We had a democratic presidential primary that day. CDC officials were just starting to warn about a coronavirus uh, outbreak in the US. Uh, the number one song was The Box by, Body, uh, by Roddy Rich, and it, it also happened to be National Pancake Day at IHOP. Uh, and that was the day that uh, that Takeda exercised the option to purchase PVP. So that long journey, uh, ended on 20, the 25th of February, 2020 for us. Now the, the, um, the molecule did get purchased, uh, the, the, the program got purchased and, and it is uh, progressing um, at Takeda. So that was the day that we had to give up our baby um, to, to someone who was able to bring it through the large scale clinical trials uh, that are really needed. So now uh, Kuma 62, now TAC 62 is in phase two clinical trials. Um, there's a, uh, uh, you can find the clinical trial on clinicaltrials.gov. It's registered, um, it is recruiting. The first patients with celiac disease were dosed this past summer. So, um, so we're hoping that um, in the next, this is a long phase two study. Um, we're expecting a readout in 2025. Uh, to see whether this enzyme is working. I should mention that, that when PBP was acquired, um, all of the employees were laid off and certain employees such as myself were co contracted back. But since Takeda had been working with us that whole time, um, they didn't necessarily need our day-to-day -day help anymore uh, because, they, um, because they understood the program and basically hit the ground running. Um, so we're, we're peripherally involved in moving this forward, um, but this is mostly now being, uh, the work is being performed at Takeda. Um, our team members are now working on all kinds of different world problems. Uh, Clancy Wolf, as I mentioned, he was the research scientist that I originally hired at the IPD. He came with, uh, with me to PVP when we spun out. Uh, he was now, he was one of the first lab members at Icosavax, uh, which is also a UW spin out. Um, developing vaccines. Um, as for me, I was the chief scientific officer at PVP after we took on Adam Simpson as our CEO. Before that, I was the, the CEO. Um, and I went uh, basically from being CSO at PVP uh, to be I, I rolled right into becoming a full-time homeschooling parent for about six months because that was at the beginning of COVID and, um, and you know, the schools had shut down at that point. Um, so that was my job for about six months. And then I, uh, the kids were able to go back to school and I took a, a, a chief technology officer position at Mopac Biologics, which is another IPD uh, start out. Uh, uh, spin out, we're um, developing therapeutics to treat IBD. Uh, I'm also a translational advisor uh, at the IPD, um, in, in which capacity I advise and help out um, other startup companies that are coming out of the IPD uh, at the UW um, with whatever help they, they might currently be looking for. Um, I, I, 
sometimes I give a talk in bioengineering at which they always ask me what I would have done differently um, if I were to do this over again. So I just made, I just have a slide that talks about a few things that I would have done differently um, with the startup um, as we progressed, uh, you know, but of course it's hindsight. Um, first of all, I mentioned, uh, you know, we started, started our license negotiations in a non-cost deferred manner. Um, we initially found a PDP as an LLC, not a C Corp. That ended up, I, I mentioned having big tax implications because uh, there's, there's, um, there's, there's a massive tax advantage if you can hold your shares uh, for more than five years before the company is acquired, but that only is relevant for shares in a C Corp, not an LLC. Um, so it's just something uh, to think about in terms of early company structure. Uh, we could have been a little more discriminating with our early cap table. We we were brand new. We we were scientists. We didn't know how to set up a cap table, and we didn't understand that it, later on in our company we would be struggling to uh, to scrape up half a percent for in, you know individuals here or there that we were bringing on. Um, we, we didn't know how much to give early advisors, and we ended up making a couple of. Um, I don't know if it's called them mistakes necessarily, but things we might have done differently uh, uh, had we come with that, um, more with that wisdom. Um, we almost went with a CEO that would have taken the company in a very different direction. Uh, this, is, Thankfully, we didn't do that because I think that, that in retrospect, that would have been a bad decision. But the people that you choose to make those decisions about your company, uh, you really need to be discriminating about who, uh, who, who you choose to either make those decisions or help you make those decisions. Uh, people have different backgrounds and different interests. Um, in, in retrospect, we went directly from grant funding into this partnership with Takeda, and I mentioned all of our um, all of our team worked at risk. That actually ended up being a little difficult for a couple of team members uh, because the negotiations for our uh, deal with Takeda took longer than we than we had originally anticipated, and it ended up being difficult for a couple of team members to keep working and not receive any salary. So, in retrospect, we probably should have taken about a million dollars in in seed excuse me, in seed funding to um, to help move this along at an early stage. Um, but, uh, but you know, I, I, I list those things about things we would have done differently, but it's been just a, a fantastic experience and taking a project that you're working on uh, from its inception, uh, from the original concept idea all the way to into uh, clinical trials has um, has been a, a humbling and rewarding experience. And um, so I, I, I I really couldn't change anything about about what we did, and um, and now I, I guess I'll turn it over to to Yuli for any any questions. Thanks, Ingrid. Uh, that was an amazing presentation. Thanks for going back through the timeline. Um, it was a pleasure to catch you at the very end of your uh, membership and your tenure at Commotion Labs Food Call. Uh, we have a lot of questions, uh, so we're going to try to get through as many of them. But um, if we don't get through everyone's questions. I assume you're okay with people emailing you their follow-up questions? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's why I have my um, email address here if anyone's right. curious. Thanks. Uh, so PBP was based on the single asset, uh, Kuma 62, now TAP 62. Did you consider building a platform company with multiple assets? Uh, yeah, we did, we did. Um, so in the early, uh, when we spun out of the UW, or when we were trying to do so, when we were talking to, to VCs, um, we had, uh, th there was a lot of talk about what our company should be, should be structured. Should we, should we just roll with Kuma 62, uh, it, that being by far our strongest asset and see where we can go uh, just with that asset, development of that asset? Or should we develop a platform company um, in which, you know, we'd be a GI-based company that had assets for multiple disease, multiple indications where we'd have some in the pipeline uh, and earlier in the pipeline and others would be further along. Uh, and then, you know, would we license out those each asset or or would the goal be to get the whole company acquired there are a lot of different ways that you can structure a company like this um ultimately we ended up kuma 62 was was 
our asset. And ultimately, we ended up being an asset driven company, uh, mostly because that was what our our customer, our funder was interested in. Um, so Takeda was interested in in that asset and um, and you know, basically that one alone. So that that is what we focused on. And the goal then became to get the company acquired in a few years so that we could all roll into, into something new uh, instead of doing something new in the PVP structure itself. Um, but it, it really, uh, you know, when we were talking to VCs, uh, we had ta been talking about, you know, potentially making a platform company as well. So it really depends on what what you're interested in for your company, what kind of company you're trying to build, what your goals are, and the goals of your partners. Right. Uh, what advice would you have for people who are considering starting a company versus a more traditional career? Um, I would say that uh, that starting a company can be very rewarding as long as you have, um, you know, something. It, it, getting started is a lot easier if you have something that you can really base your company on uh setting out uh setting out with a technology that is is you know very promising um and, and staking staking your work and your career on it can be can be quite daunting uh certainly there's a lot more stability in a more traditional route um but if you have if you're able to have um, flexibility, if you're able to have uh, support uh, in your life outside of work, because it takes a long time and a lot of hard work in those earlier stages to, to get a company off the ground. Um, if you're, if you have a family or want to start a family, uh, that having a, a supportive partner with very flexible hours is also very important. Living close to your work is um, something that also helps. Uh, if you're going to go a startup route and a lot of startups, you know, are very risky. So you have to balance that with whether you're willing to take the risk uh, and doing all of the work, uh, figuring out, um, you know, all of your HR benefits, all of that stuff um, versus going more traditional route. There are certainly um, uh, advantages and disadvantages to each path. How early in your academic journey did you realize you were entrepreneurial? And who were your role models that inspired you to pursue that startup path? Um, how early in my academic? Well, I think I was always, you know, I, I went into graduate school because I was interested in the science, the technology, uh, and um, and passionately so. So when I was first in graduate school, I figured I would become a professor at the UW, have my own lab, um, learn things, uh, research things, um, which I thought would be great fun. But as I went through graduate school, and, and that's basically because I wasn't introduced to to sort of the world beyond uh, the the concept that there are other jobs outside of academia that could be um, intellectually fulfilling, in which you could work with other people that were passionate about improvement of people's lives, um, about developing products that that really had an effect. Those people exist in academia and industry and um, and in government, and and uh, it's not specific to academia. So I would say in the middle of um, my uh, academic careers is when I kind of opened the door to all kinds of different um, potential careers. Um, but I, it didn't occur to me to be an entrepreneur until it was clear that we had something that that could be really valuable. So when we did, after we developed the Kumamax prototype is when I, I considered becoming an entrepreneur to, to be able to, um, to uh, push that forward. Right. Oh, and role models. Um, I mean, I've worked with a lot of really smart people. I think my biggest role model is probably Tachi Yamada, who um, who is so passionate and also um, is really down to earth and discriminating about uh, about the projects he worked with. Boundless energy, 
um, was most proud of the things that he accomplished in his life that really impacted people's lives and made their life and, and improved people's lives, particularly in third world countries. Um, his passion and, and um, his ability to cut things out of his life and, and out of his projects that he was advising that didn't work towards um, pursuing those goals, I, I think he was a major role model um, for sure. But, you know, I think we are all, we all act as role models to each other in, in this world. Great. Yeah, um, in your slides, it's amazing to see the names and faces of all the individuals who currently are so prominent and helping in Seattle Biotech Startup uh, today. Uh, it's really great to see uh, Clancy in the lab too. It's still called, it's still referred to as the PVP space, even though like there's been multiple. Oh. <laughs> That's awesome. I think we did some work building out that space. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, I've never corrected them. I, I also <laughs> refer to it that way. Um, okay. You mentioned how valuable the team is for a startup. What's your advice when building out a team? Um, well, for us, so we needed, we were coming into PVP having tremendous experience and expertise and knowledge of the biochemistry of the enzyme, understanding how the enzyme works, what factors were likely to influence it. But we had no experience in um, in in working with the FDA, and we had no experience in clinical trials, and and very little experience in scaling up manufacturing from that that small scale to the very large scales I mentioned. So what we were looking for was a team that complemented our deficiencies in knowledge and expertise. Um, we weren't looking for another group of academic scientists um, because of what our goals were. And our goals were to drive this asset through clinical trials. Um, it's great to have a team that is new to the to the field, that is hungry, that is willing to, to work, you know, nights and days for, for pennies to put in the amount of effort that's needed to make, say, a platform company successful. But for our asset-based company, we did not want to be learning on the job when we were making our first regulatory submissions to the FDA. That was a bad idea for us. So we needed people who had done this before. And so what we were looking for was a team of people that had taken a GI asset through clinical trials. And, and that's what we selected. And we ended up selecting a good team. Another thing was that we picked we picked our team. They had all worked together before, so they we knew they could work together well. And in fact, they liked it so much that they wanted to work together again. Um, that's really valuable because when you're starting a, a, a new team, uh, having people that know how to work well together and like working together um, it is is great as opposed to starting when everyone is new and learning each other and then you may maybe you have some personnel differences and issues and um and, and so we, we didn't have have those issues so that is another thing that i would recommend right uh beyond the whoops uh the whoopsies you mentioned what were the hard what were the, like the notable hardships or challenges you faced as a new company let's see um well, I mean, that, that question is very broad because we had technical, we had technical challenges and we had personnel challenges, uh, e even work, you know, working with the team that, that had worked very well before some of our consultants we had challenges with. Um, we had, um, I mean, we had trouble. I, I mentioned we submitted two INDs. One of the, the arms of our project I just didn't, we couldn't get the methods that we were working on to work at all. So we ended up having to um, start from the drawing board and sort of redesign that part of the project from scratch. Um, I would say... Uh, you know, our biggest challenge was initially getting funding, uh, getting that, um, getting that contract signed by Takeda was the biggest achievement 
um, the rest of it was was we were just executing on the contract. Um, that that was probably the biggest challenge. But um, and you know, week by week, we would have something that would make it seem like it's not going to go through. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm I, I, I'm not really sure how to answer the question because the whole thing was challenging, but also extremely interesting and rewarding. So, um, so yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's a very general question. Um, I'll get you out on one last question. Uh, what are you currently reading? What am I reading? Um, um, well, I have started a chapter of this book called Geek Love, um, which is kind of a, a bizarre book, and I'm just reading it because I found it in the basement of our house. <laughs> Uh, I don't really know where it came from. Um, it's a strange book, um, but you know, it seems to be interesting. I don't have a lot of time for to read fiction, but when I do, I, I really t try to take time to myself um, um, to uh, uh, to relax and try to be able to read a book from time to time. But frankly, um, I'm, kind of, I'm a little bit busy, so it's it's hard. You know, the, I can typically be seen reading some science paper but now and then I, I i try to slip in a chapter of fiction great well thanks a lot ingrid uh that's all the time we have for today thank you all for joining us today and again big thank you to you ingrid for sharing your wisdom and experience with the group uh yeah. as a reminder uh next friday at noon we'll be hearing from brandon doyle of violet uh scaling a hardware startup with uw as a partner uh sign up for that and we'll see you next week have a good weekend. Thank you.